Thank you all for tuning in. Welcome to local band Smoke Out Canada. You know what, first we off, are- let's see this. So this is going to be our guest later, DJ Temple of Without Mercy and Temple Music Academy. If you're not familiar with either of those, let's go check out Without Mercy right now. Get you a little little shindig from them. I believe they released an album about a year ago. Maybe two. Maybe two. DJ does streaming as well. Uh, you can find them at withoutmercyband.com. I'm gonna, but they got a new site. Oh, new site coming. Okay, so keep an eye on that. But these guys have been a while for a while. They are endorsed by Ernie Ball, Jim Dunlop, and EMG Pickups. You can find them at Instagram at Without Mercy Band, Facebook at Without Mercy Band, and on the official YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Without Mercy. So uh, they got some cool stuff. We're going to check out their music as well, but I also want to show you Temple Music Academy, which is a music school located in Abbotsford, British Columbia. Fantastic thing that uh, DJ is going. Uh, as it says here, no contracts, no hidden fees, all ages welcome. They teach everyone. Uh, my buddy Swan, former guitarist of Crimson Caliber and uh, currently working on projects such as Hawaiian Donkey Punch and Rose Thorn, uh, is taking lessons from him. And yeah, just solid dude. He also does streams every once in a while. So if we want Jeff Loomis talks without mercy, my goodness. That's cool. I want to check this out quickly. Hey everybody, Jeff Loomis here. This is uh, quite an honor for me to be here talking to you about my good buddy DJ Temple and his killer band Without Mercy. This is a band that hails from Vancouver, Canada, a couple hours up north from me here in Seattle. DJ and I go back a couple years now. We've been good friends. We share a lot of the same influences when it comes to music and guitar players and things like that. My reaction is to what you said. That's fucking cool. I'm stoked. That's awesome. Play a guest solo. This is also cool. Because, you know, the music is very aggressive and uh, it was a very challenging solo for me to put down. I play on the opening track of the album called Thunderbird and the album Seismic drops November 20th and you can pre-order it at Without Mercy Band. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. That's uh, That's cool. Let's uh, watch a guitar playthrough of The Disaster. Guys, if you have any questions for DJ, feel free to put them in the chat during the interview. God, how crazy he is on the fucking fretboard. Oh, 
Oh yeah, we knew there was. A, we, he wasn't done. He wasn't done the ripping. No, he's quite the guitarist. DJ, how's it going? Thanks for taking time to be on the show. Hell yeah, buddy. Can you hear me all right? I sure can. Oh, that's so good. I'm always worried that my Mac setup doesn't work here. Dude, uh, don't worry. Usually there's always some kind of technical difficulty that has to be dealt with. But I'm glad that this is working off the hop. I gotta say, oh yeah, but let me kill the lights in the back here so it's a better for sure. betterness. For sure, and we're good to go, bud. Boom, boom. Go back in my little media room here. Is this uh, at uh, Temple? Yes, sir. Hell yeah, that's cool. Been most of my days, as they say. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. I got to say, it's been forever since we've had the chance to talk. I love um, that we now get to again and we get to do it here on the show. I got to say, last time I saw you had more hair. Yeah, dude, I cut it all off. Where the fuck's my drink at now? Jesus. How, how, does, that, that how does that feel? As, as a fellow long hair, I have... I've, Always wonder, like, how's that gonna feel once you finally chop it all off? It's pretty amazing. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I uh, it was about time. About time. That's awesome. Well, for everyone uh, tuning in who may not be familiar, uh, feel free to introduce yourself and give them just a little, I guess, uh, taste of what it is you do and what you're about. We've tried to do a little bit of promo, but I always like having it come from uh, the individual themselves. Uh, my name's DJ. I play guitar. That's that's I don't know. I'm not super important. I like to uh, like to pretend I am, I suppose. Uh, I play in a death metal band. That's how I met you. And I run the Temple Music Academy, both in person and online. Here in Abbotsford, BC. That's that's really cool. So um, online, is that something you uh, shifted to doing after like the pandemic started or was that something that you already had going? I can't quite remember on that. We already we always had it going. I always believed it online because that's just the way the world should have been. I thought you could get access to teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, during the, the horrendousness of those two years, we may have upped the ante a bit on that, <laughs> but uh, we always did online for sure. Okay, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. So you were ahead of the curve on that and encouraging that from way before that, which is really cool because I think for a lot of people, they only really started entertaining that thought when they got to that point. And uh, for people such as yourselves, I imagine you had a bit of a better um, understanding of how to properly um, actually teach through that medium because it is slightly different than in person. I mean, sure, we're face to face, but we're, we can't like... I can't touch your guitar and be like, okay, no, you got to hit these things. So what were things that you found um, going into that pandemic teaching uh, probably a variety of different um, calibers of students from beginners to maybe more intermediate and uh, skilled players? Uh, did you feel that there was anything you had figured out uh, before that that gave you just an edge in being able to better instruct and help these guitarists and musicians at that time? hundred uh, percent. It was language. So um, what I would do is I would, instead of, you know, uh, you have to grab your 
take your pick and move it over to the string that is right here and i want you to strum four times and then take this hand and move it over there it became too much so like if i was to say to you uh, hey nate can you do me solid and put your left hand just up in the sky up in the sky all the way up for me real quick and just grab onto that cable real quick and just move it three times for me just grab onto the cable three times perfect buddy thank you so much that's the hand that's actually going to do the work for us now so we just okay. we went that route that's really cool and that's intuitive i like that because um i imagine that helps um get rid of a little bit of that physical disconnect because even though we're not um, again, in person, that little bit of physicality now allows just a bit more uh, verbal communication to be easier to understand. Um, that's really cool. Um, did you find there were any um, hurdles that you had to overcome during that pandemic uh, with everyone? And I do want to talk about Without Mercy as well, but honestly, the thing that I love about you the most is the fact that you do Temple uh, Music Academy and that you do all this stuff, meeting you through playing music and like seeing you kill it on stage is one thing. And I have a lot of admiration for a lot of very skilled musicians, but to take that skill and actively put it into something that gives back to the musical community and helps a variety of musicians of all ages progress and feel like they have that uh, window and that um, outlet. I, I, I fucking love that. I can't say anything like I, I can't go off about it any more than I usually do. I love that about you. Um, but yeah, were there any hurdles you came across during that pandemic um, that you kind of had to adjust around? Because that was a crazy time for everyone. There was, everyone got thrown something that they had to figure out. Yeah, we got hit. We got hit with like a, uh, like, I don't want to think my problems are worse than anybody else's, but they were pretty big to us. Like, Things like we still had to pay full rent here at the academy, although we weren't allowed in it. So that was a little frustrating to me being maintaining that at the same time as trying to keep the business running. And we're we're pretty ebb and flow and cool with people as far as tuition payments go. You know, if you're struggling or whatever, we'll work with you. Like we're not, you've met me. I, I'm not cutthroat about really anything. I'm pretty chill. So that was a weird hurdle. And some of the technical things were weird. Like Zoom didn't have this. Uh, we use Zoom primarily for it. And Zoom didn't have the uh, the the organic sound or original sound for musicians as the setting it has now. Okay. But it didn't have it back then. So when you played like an electric guitar, it would get washed out and we couldn't get DI signals to work. And Ooh. God forbid playing with a backing track, trying to teach someone to solo over it, right? So that was... That was pretty serious, especially in our drum program. That that was something that really had to be addressed. And we got it kind of innovative that way with, with things like that. But aside from the classic, like, um, uh, yeah, I still had to pay rent on a place I wasn't allowed into. The uncertainty of the whole thing, breeding anxiety, that was a thing that was really real. I never really had anxiety before, but I tell you, man, not knowing whether or not your business was going to be there tomorrow was not cool. And then the guilt there was guilt because what happened for us was was uh oh yeah that's my alarm to remind me to get on the interview with you <laughs> <laughs> the uh the guilt of um what happened with us was we have been open about six years now and at the time of the pandemic it was like four maybe three or a half or whatever but uh let's call it four and we had always in all of our advertising and marketing mentioned the online thing so when when online became a thing, all the other places in town, their students started coming over to us because the attitude seemed to be from, from the, the entrance interviews we gave, they were like, well, you've always advertised. We just assumed you were ahead of the curve and knew how to use the equipment better. So we're going to come to you anyway. And I was like, all right. And then Serb started becoming a thing for a lot of people. So they started to use it as makeshift daycare. Okay. I'm going to up my kids lessons to an hour and sign up my other kid for an hour. Because then I got two hours to myself that the government's essentially paying for, right? Yeah. So we had to scramble to hire more teachers. Like, that was insane. Wow. Like, I would go into my second office at my home where we were teaching online out of, and I was in there like nine hours, ten hours a day, just back-to-back -back students, man. That is, that's crazy. Like, the thought had occurred, like, there would be some kind of upsurge in overall online practice and tutoring, but... I never really thought of how, like, things like CERB, for instance, would drastically help that number because, on one hand, at first, the idea of people just 
funding their kids taking guitar lessons. It's like, okay, if they can fund one, that's awesome. They're probably scrambling to do everything else. But having that resource there to be like, well, now I have something to get me some free time. Here, uh, can you take them both? Thank you. Peace. Yeah, that's 100%, which, which then became even easier because then as long as I had two rooms in their house and two iPads or something like that, or one, one of each, they could be getting piano lessons in the bedroom while I'm teaching guitar to the other one in the living room downstairs or, or whatever, and they could get drum lessons and singing lessons in the second bedroom, and it was this whole thing of us hiring all these teachers online and which is a cool thing. Cause I have some friends, I'm lucky enough to have some friends who are kind of well-known musicians. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like we had the opportunity to just hire them straight up and being like, yeah, just come on in, work under the banner, keep all the money. I don't need to make a profit off you cause we're bros and I'm really not into making profit off friends. So just take the money, you organize the lessons. Maybe you guys can maintain this after the world isn't a shithole anymore. And then you have like a side hustle. So a bunch of them now, like they have, they maintaining 20, 30 lessons a week. And that's just makes me feel good. I'm like, yeah, cool. We helped with that. Sweet. And and that just allows more people to get into it. Cause uh, for myself for a long time, being a promoter and someone in a small scene, this, the thing that I always felt was like, Oh man, if we aren't getting younger people involved at some point, this is going to die. Like, even if we're seeing growth now with our people, it's a certain age group and at a certain point you need younger people to actively want to be involved and feel like, you know, it's something they want to do and be a part of. And having those resources, I've noticed out of the shit time that we had for those two years, a lot of younger faces showing up and just young musicians, young bands um, coming into their scenes and just kicking ass for lack of a better term. Like, I'm loving seeing that as, um, I guess, a consequence of going through that era. Um, Due to, again, like people like you and other individuals in the scenes providing outlets for them. I'm actually rather enthusiastic now with uh, everything that's happening. I like that. Um, You brought up the fact that there are some, like, more well-known friends of yours. And it ties a little bit into a question that uh, someone in the chat here has for you, because... We were doing a little promo going through the uh, the old Without Mercy YouTube, and we saw a little message from Jeff Loomis uh, promoting your most recent record. And oh. Paul then um, wanted to ask you, so how has your relationship with Jeff Loomis influenced your guitar playing and compositional writings? It hasn't at all. <laughs> um, it hasn't at all because, like, I was a fan of Jeff forever. Um. I mean, my wife nicknames nicknames me the fanboy of Jeff. Uh, I was a fan of Jeff forever, and then when we got the opportunity to work together, that was really cool. And it was in a it was in a professional context involving the record and doing a guest spot and then uh, promos and stuff. And then he just he asked me a business question one day, and as I do, I answer. I don't really I'm not really into gatekeeping. I which I didn't even know that was the term for it, but now I've learned that's the term is when people gatekeep their knowledge. I was just like, oh no, man, you should just X Y Z one two three. Yeah. He's like, well, I don't even know how to do that. Oh, I'll just fucking do it for you. Sure, I got like I got the computers open right here and that led to him inviting me over and i helped him do a bunch of shit at his house and then um he yeah we just kind of stayed in touch he became a really good friend of mine he's a sweetheart of a human being like as good as you guys think he is at guitar which let's be real it's jeff fucking loomis he's pretty fucking good but as good as he is at guitar he's actually a nicer human like that that's what blew me away I'm I'm at his house helping him fix some shit on the computer and stuff, and this fucking guy is like worried if I'm warm enough. Do I have enough to eat? Do I want to take a break? Don't work too hard. Hey, how about we just go outside and go for a walk? Get the circulation going. Are you sure you're warm enough? Are you cold enough? Do you want another soda? Do you want me to get you some sandwiches or something? I'm like, who the hell is this guy? And like for those of you that know, Jeff's from Wisconsin originally, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and that that's exactly what I was having. There's this like Midwestern Wisconsin guy trying to make sure the hospitality's up. So he's amazing as a human all around. But at that point, I had already been like a fan of his to the point that I had. Um, this is going to sound wrong, but I had exhausted the influence in my own playing already. Yeah. Okay. If I get. That, it. I get what you mean by that. Uh. He had, he had given me a lot of cool advice, though, for the band and, and business stuff, because like stuff, 
stuff you just never see because that level's not unlocked. Yeah. You know, like uh, I that that was that that was the cool thing. So that was pretty neat. But yeah, I hope that answers the question. That does, and uh, it goes into a lot of other things because um, you touched on something which I think uh, might slightly answer another question I want to ask. But um, the idea of like. Um, not gatekeeping that knowledge, like having someone like Jeff Loomis ask you, how do you do this? And you'd be like, Oh dude, it's this easy. If you don't know, I'll, I'll help you set it up. And then, because a lot of these things are easy once you know how to do it, that initial setting right. things up, getting things going, that's the thing that's really hard for people to go. But if you're able to help people get these small little things figured out so that they can go on their own journey and figure it out and just be a voice, not a voice of reason, but something to be like, well, these are your options. You you have to make your own choice. But here here are the things you can do. Here are the ways you can go about it, X, Y, or Z, or here are the tools that you have at your disposal. That's really helping, uh, again, the evolution and the expansion of not just musicians, but just communities in general. And uh, that ties into the question, I'm not sure if I've already asked you this, because we had a nice long conversation a few years ago. And a part of me feels like I should have gone back and listened to that just to be like, what what all did we talk about? I know we talked about a lot of stuff in the Vancouver scene, but I'm not right. sure if we covered what I think it was. Maybe it was just an idea you had and then uh, the wife like kind of pushed you to do it after a while. But the initial desire to do Temple Music Academy. Yeah. That, that, that was that? So, yeah, 100%. So So that's... The original thing for Temple Music was uh, in life, I believe that either the two things required are either inspiration or desperation. That That's a quote that I had heard forever ago. And this is this is the case. I was selling TVs at Future Shop while Without Mercy was still trying to figure out how we were going to get what would be our self-titled record done. Um. And we didn't know where we were going to record it. We didn't know about the money, yada, yada. I actually worked up to be like the number two or three salesman in the company for Future Shop at that point. Um, I was I was crushing like $60,000 days in a four-hour shift. Um, I, when I say that, I mean like volume. I wasn't yeah. making that. No, that was, was just pushing the, the that gross of, of what you were putting out. And uh, that was that was really easy, Nate. Like, all, It's amazing what happens in sales when you're just honest and don't rip people off. You're like, no, I wouldn't buy that. Why? Because it's kind of a piece of shit. We put it on there as a profit margin. Sorry, dude. Like, it was amazing. But I ended up getting fired from that job. And the way the Future Shop fired me was they fired me after already processing my termination. So I showed up to work that day. They let me get about three hours in, shit canned me, and informed me that that night at 2 a.m. I would be getting my final paycheck, any severance and vacation pay I had stocked up. And at this point in the story... I was the only one working with Janelle, who's now my wife, and we were getting married in six months and paying for our own wedding. Uh, it's still relatively early that Janelle was still in bed, because, I mean, why would anybody else get up at 7 o'clock in the morning if you didn't have to? Yeah. And I remember driving home, because it's from a town called Chilliwack, which is about half an hour away from here, and I'm like, I'm commuting half an hour. I'm the number two or three sales guy, and they still shit can me. And the original thing on papers because a bunch of shit went down and I spoke up and was like, you, you can't fucking do that to customers, man. That's, that's dirty as fuck. You can't do that. That's the real reason. But yeah, they put on paper, like I wasn't dedicated, you know, too much time off for my band or whatever. And I was like, okay, this is shitty. Um, and I'm driving home going, you might as well just dump me because why the hell? And Janelle, I woke her up and I said, look, look, I just got fired. It happened like an hour ago. I'm still not emotionally okay with this. I don't know how we're going to make rent, let alone pay for this wedding. And they're like, we were fucking broke, dude. And, uh, and she just like half asleep was like, I didn't like that job for you because it was turning you into things that I knew were against like your moral code. Like in order to be successful at this job financially, you have to lie by omission. You have to convince people of stuff they don't want or need. And I, I hate doing that. So she's like, yeah, this is a good thing. And the second thing is you need to go find a way to play guitar for a living because that's what the universe is telling you you need to be doing. So I was like, okay, well, the obvious answer would be teaching. So I'm kind of a shitty guitar player. I should probably get lessons better then. 
And then I started taking lessons, but I didn't have any money. So I started bartering on these like, hey, I'll cut your lawn if you teach me what the hell the circle of fifths is. You know, or Damn. I'm good at computer shit. I can MySpace was huge at the time, and I figured out that MySpace was really just borrowing most of its code from HTML, and I had already taught myself HTML, so I I was one of the first people that knew how to like customize your MySpace page with all the overlays and shit. Okay. So I try I tried to do that. I tried to make EPKs or like those press kits for people. Anything I could do. Then I got one student, which became two students, then I lost them both. Then I got three students, then I lost them both. Then I got a job at a shitty music thing in town here and I'm super underqualified for it. Uh, and I lost all the students they gave me just for being dog shit. But I was like, I'm not gonna stop. Fuck no. Um but the reason everybody's quitting has to be that I am a shitty teacher. So why am I shitty? Let's look at the top three reasons and fix those three. Because you can make a list 15 long when you're depressed, of course. Yeah. But I can't deal with a list of 15. I can deal with a list of three, but I can't deal with a list of 15. So I fixed the list of three. I got a different job at a different place, and I didn't lose them all, but I lost like 80%. But Janelle pointed out that's a 20% win. I'm like, okay, I'm glad you're here because I'm not seeing any of this. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I got the coup de gras. I got the show, as I call it, which is uh, I got the call because I quit the, the second place to try and start my own, and it failed fucking miserably. It was disgustingly bad. And then I was unemployed. I had no money and no students, nothing for like three months. And a buddy of mine called and offered me, said that he had negotiated me a subbing gig at Long and McQuaid, which, as you can imagine, would be the show. This is the biggest place in the country, uh, you know, biggest chain in the country. I mean, he got me one in uh, like Metro Vancouver area, too. So the foot traffic, the whole nine. And I walked in there and I was like, I remember like hyping myself up in the car. I was like, I am not going to fuck this up. I know what needs to happen. I know why I sucked before, blah, blah, blah. And I went in, and unbeknownst to me, I subbed one day, and I went home, and then they brought me back the next week for the exact same day, exact same students. I subbed that day. I went home. They cut me a check for, like, the two days. It was, like, 15 lessons in total for two weeks or something like that. And I, and I went home, and I just fucked off. And then I got a call from the store manager. And the store manager was like, we literally just had all 15 come to us and ask if they could switch teachers to you. But you don't work here, so we want to solve this problem. <laughs> so I was like, great, sold. And uh, I got that gig, and I used that gig as the metric by which, there. if you look at it from a business perspective, there is no one bigger in Canada than Long and McQuaid. So if you suck as a teacher and you're trying to improve, this is the place to go because the revolving door of students will let you trial and error very rapidly. And I used it. I just used this trial there. What do I suck at? I suck at this in guitar. Okay, I suck at that. I suck at this. Okay, I can only handle three. I can't handle 15 problems. What are my three? What am I doing? Let's get lessons. Let's get this. And that's how I got into like lessons with fucking Chris Broderick. So I was like, okay, well, that solves all my fucking theory problems. Every yeah. goddamn one of them is solved. And there's a certain, like, I use a slang term around here called, like, removing CPU power or load off the CPU. Yeah. Is a, uh, I know my theory's weak at this point in the story, but I can remove all of that insecurity and problems because now I have a mentor whose sole job to me will be to fix that problem. And anything I come across, I strategically placed all my lessons with Chris to be on a Saturday. Because any problem I run into Monday to Friday, I'm going to address with him on Saturday. That's, that's brilliant. Because there's so many things in there that um, you did or had there to, as a, like, not a crush, but like a reinforcement to help you maintain the mindset you had because like like you said starting going in down in the dumps just because of the job loss and how they did you dirty and there is something about electronics companies i tell you what like this sounds eerily familiar to when i left best buy a few years ago being like <laughs> all right walking in and huh there's a there's a there's a thinness to the air today what's what's up yeah. but um but using that and having someone be like, no, you're good at this, do this. 
and then having the the balls essentially to not only pursue it but to look at yourself as you were going and be like okay well where do i need to improve how much criticism self-criticism can i even handle to be able to actively make the steps needed to improve like you said focus on the top three not 15 because in a certain mindset you can just go down a whirlpool and you're not going to you're going to spend more time trying to pull yourself out of that than actually working on anything at that point. But if you just focus on your core things, you can go from there. And then from that, having someone reinforcing you again as a going, a going from losing customers, uh, sorry, <laughs> losing uh, clients and customers a few times and then getting to a situation where you're losing less of them. Like you're going from all of them to maintaining 20% and allowing that improvement to go and find, putting yourself in situations to allow that improvement and working on yourself while also use it, utilizing your resources to improve where you need the help and utilizing it all. It's a lot of moving parts when you dissect it. And I really like that. And it takes a lot of work. And it, um, I imagine it took a lot of like mental work as well because Everyone can go on uh, similar journeys, but it's easy to fall off, kind of maybe not have the right support in your ear at the time and make the wrong moves and have to course correct after. But putting in that work still and recognizing it, um, I imagine that was most of the stress with everything. Because especially after you uh, talk to Chris and felt more competent in your, uh, your theory aspect, because as long as I've known you, you just glide on that goddamn fretboard. It kind of, I can't follow it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that, man. It's uh, getting mentors is, is I, I have several still to this day. I, when it came time that I was done with Long and McQuaid because I thought that I could, it was never about the money at Long and McQuaid. It was about what experience can I get from every angle of this business so that I can eventually open my own. And it was always about the students. What did the students need? How could I get that from the students? Um, I'm paying hundreds of dollars a month for lessons with Broderick. Uh, U.S., so the exchange rate is just absurd. And I'm like, I'm using this solely right now for like 10% improving my ability, 90% for helping the students I can't help right now. Mm -hmm. And I would just straight tell him this. And he would be like, hey, man, you got to learn it some way, so this is cool. He's another sweetheart human, right? But when I exhausted that, I was like, okay, it's time to try my own. What are all of the things that I know Long and McQuaid is doing wrong? And I am so fortunate to have Janelle because I feel goddamn bulletproof with her. Like, that's it. Like, all of you, let's say everybody, whatever, you know, without mercy sucks. DJ's a fucking loser, yada, yada, yada. Um, but Janelle's like, no one cares, DJ, work harder. Like that whole thing, like she's just pushing me, work harder. At one point, I remember at one point, I've never shared this outside of uh, the girl. I think, I don't think I did. One point, a very vital member of our band quit the band at the most inopportune time in my life. And the reason I bring this up is because this is in the same height of me doing the long McQuaid thing, trying to figure out all this shit without mercy's finally getting like a little bit of a pull because by this point we had recorded the album. Finally, we had negotiated an amazing deal that is unheard of. Like if I told you what we did, you wouldn't believe me, but uh, we actually got to record it at like one of the biggest studios in Vancouver, and we negotiated the owner of the studio to let us finance it for a year because we could afford greater monthly payments, which allowed us to double our budget. Damn. And he was like, sure, that sounds good. Whatever. So I was like, oh, my God. OK, <laughs> damn. So we got. We got this push. We were going and our vocalist at the time, Alexis, she just wasn't into it. She just wasn't into the band. Another band was um, uh, Grass is Greener, Other Side kind of scenario. And she just bailed. She just bailed when we had a tour booked. But she went off with them and she took the bass player we had at the time, effectively killing the band, right? Um, and just no notice, just like, I'm done, goodbye. 
Best you know, of luck, peace. Yeah. By the way, you know, all those shows that you guys can't do now, we actually jumped in and took for it was it was pretty rough, dude. I'm not gonna lie. It's like it's like having your girl dump you for a guy that they said they were just friends and then you have to watch the OnlyFans after. Oh like it's just it's just horrific, right? And uh we were pretty butthurt at the time. Now it's just kind of funny or whatever, but I was I was like done. I remember I came home, uh I just laid in the bed, depressed. Uh, Janelle always teases me. She's like, oh, I don't remember going to Starbucks and ordering a depresso. <laughs> uh, she's, she always she always rips me, dude. It's, it's amazing. Uh, but uh, she's just like, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh, this, that, the other thing. And Alexis did this. And uh, the fucking Long and McQuay's not working out. That's it. I'm done with music. Fuck it. I'm going to go do the lifeline job that's been offered to me a hundred times in the last year. Uh, and Janelle's like, oh, yeah, so you're, you're giving up then? I'm like, yeah, that's it. I'm fucking done. She's like, okay, that's great. I'm sure Alexis will be really happy to hear that. Ooh. And then she walked out of the room like a fucking boss. Ooh, damn. That's all she said. And it took me like eight minutes, and I came out of the room, and I was like, fuck this. <laughs> fuck this. And then I just... That's it. I overutilized mentors to the point I was like, hey, I don't know how to solve this problem. What do I do? And they're like, you should do this. And I would just blindly do what they said. And um, yeah, you know, then you saw us. Then we got fucking Alex and Rye Guy. Like, what a what oh, a fucking like, prime, <laughs> prime lineup. Fucking love and, and their senses of humor. And we all click. We just got together at, at my house. And because uh, I just learned this new steak recipe. So I just made everybody dinner. Um and we're making some big plans, which I'll, I'll talk to you yes. about off fair. But um, yeah, dude, it was great. And then we tried to open this place and it didn't work. And I tried a second time and it started to go. And then we've just been riding high. That's been it. We just work harder than everybody else. Expect more from myself. Demand for more from myself than anyone else could ever expect has always been my motto. I think I even told you that yep. years ago. Um, I do not give a flying fuck. I will work harder. I think that's one thing about you that really shines through with everything. Cause um, even when you've been down, I have not seen you not grinding to try to make something better of the situation you're in. Like even when you uh, town, I, like cause you brought it up and I remembered the fundraiser coming up, but when temple was um, having some issues during that rent thing, it wasn't a uh, all shit. Pack it up and goes like, no. What what can we do to keep this afloat? Keep this going? It's like time sucks, but at some point we're going to be able to do this again. So what do we do to get to that point? And that that determination and willpower is huge. And backed again with one thing that I think's been really key with like everything you brought up, even having just one solid person in your corner that knows how to push you in the right direction not even just by just telling you but just by saying the things that make things click for you and make you want to go no 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 i gotta no we're doing it this way i i get it now i know what i have to do thank you for uh lighting that fire <laughs> so okay um where was i gonna go without mercy let's go to that because last we talked you guys were working on seismic what oh, has the past really yeah right no that's what made me oh like, think God. about this you and i haven't talked since before the pandemic oh my god dude right like because i went into oh, my okay. own like i like i had my own things to deal with and then just figuring out my stuff during that time and figuring out how i'm going to come out of it and try to just put the best foot forward and yeah it was when Devin told me we had that, no, it was when I first tried having you on uh, out of nowhere on New Year's. But then I had my sister because she was just here. I started thinking, like, when was the last time DJ and I have had, like, an actual good, like, conversation? Not just an hi, hello through Facebook. And, yeah, it was, like, early or mid to late 2019. And just that brick hit me of, like, wow, Nate, what the f Fuck, man. I, I know you're bad at reaching out, but come on. Like, no, you just had to wait for everybody else to bail, and then you go to your third tier, which is me. Oh, no. That's how it works. No. No. Honestly, All just right, life. Well, 
just life. But yeah, you guys were working on it like seismic at that time. And I remember how hyped and excited you were. I believe you guys were getting ready to finish tracking drums and doing all this other stuff. And now we're two years past the release. How, yeah. how's that journey been? Like getting to the release, uh, what was that like? And then the reception after, cause Awkward time to have to release an album, but you guys did it. And what was that all like? Yeah, so there's... First of all, I think... I, I never try and put words in the boy's mouth or speak on their behalf, but this this one I will. We all fucking love that record. But <laughs> we signed an awful management deal before, and we were hyped about it, and the people giving us advice were literally giving us the worst fucking advice I have ever seen anyone. Like, if I was a porn star that had herpes, them telling me just keep fucking would have been less damaging than the advice that they actually gave us. Wow. When, when our careers were on the line. Like, dude, dude, where do I start? Like, holy shit. Now, I can't say the name of the management firm because that wouldn't be... I mean, you guys can Google it. It'll be pretty easy to figure it out. But uh, we, we had signed up to get Dave Otero to do, like, the, the post-production, whatever, like, the mastering and mixing yeah. of the record. But in order to be smart with our money... We hired this dude out here in Vancouver who is like Juno award winning fucking dude. Awesome guy. Been a friend of the band forever. But we're like, <laughs> money's an issue. So we want to do drums now and in a couple months come back and like do a thing. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I got you. So we'll go to this studio because we need the space for the drums. Smaller studio for guitars and stuff because we can save money on square footage and still get ripping stuff. Okay, great. I trust you. Everything's great. Awesome. And management was supposed to talk to Dave Otero for, I don't remember the date, so let's say, let's say October 1st. Yeah. Dave Otero's waiting to get our beds to begin the production. That's what was being told to us by our management. And we're like, great. October 1st, no problem. Because here we are in July. You know, we're good. Dave Otero's pretty fucking busy because, you know, Archspire basically moves in with him to do their records. Yep. So, like, they're, they're busy. He's working on the cattle decap stuff, or that's dope. I get a call from Dave Otero that he's pissed that our management hasn't been communicating deadlines. And now he's like, you know what? We I have no time to do your record. Like, unless you want to get it to me in... And again, I don't remember dates, but some unreasonably like three week timeline. Uh, oh, I was like, OK, like we're not even done base yet. <laughs> so I talked to our manager and I'm like, dude, are you going to fucking like do the thing? And he's like, well, yeah, I probably should have got on that. I'm like, holy shit, dude. And um, yeah, so that was the thing. And then we had to rush areas of the record. Jeff Loomis was still really, really slam busy, so I didn't even know if he was going to get to do the guest solo yet. Um, I, had, I had prompted him two tracks and let him choose which one he wanted to do, but I hadn't heard 100% that he was available to do it. Uh, so I was talking to Broderick, and Broderick was like, well, I can do one too. I was like, that'd be dope, dude, because you know, if Loomis bails, it, you know, we'd have yeah. Broderick too. That would be nice. In a perfect world, we'd get both. That would be sick. Um, and meanwhile, management is like, I need an update. I'm like, what do you mean an update? Like, you know where we are. He's like, I need an update so we can begin shopping your record. Shopping what record? There's no record to shop. And oh. you're, like, Dave Otero says he can't do it now. And like, all this shit. And we rushed to get like three tracks, 60% so they could begin to shop. Yeah. Which which I talked to Broderick, and he's like, yeah, that's not uh, abnormal. I mean, it's kind of weird, but it's not abnormal or whatever. So, like, they start doing the shop, and because of the deal we signed, 
there wasn't a percentage base because they came at us and said we're too small of a band for them to earn the revenue of man hours back based on performances, right? And I was like, well, I guess, you know, if we're only touring Canada getting like four or 500 a show, we'd have to, you know, and you have eight people working on our band. You know, that, that's a yeah. lot of money, I guess. So they wanted to like make this salary deal where every month they, we paid the money. So we said yes to that. That's where we're stupid really fucking stupid because it wasn't a little bit amount of money it was like pay your rent and then pay half of it again Ugh. you know like it was dumb dude and so we're we're hemorrhaging all this money to a manager and then dave otero was like you fucked up the date so i'm gonna need more than my deposit so they were hemorrhaging money over to dave otero and then we're hemorrhaging money to speed up the studio <laughs> it was like just money everywhere. Then Damn. the shops start coming back, and the shop comments are like, "Your guitar player shitty, um, uh, the guest solos are sloppy." I was like, "Did you just call Jeff Lubas sloppy? Like, are you fucking high? Like, listen to the solo in Thunderbird. He one taked that fucking thing, and I went, "I'm good, bro. I'm good. That's amazing." <laughs> Holy shit. You want to call that sloppy? All right. Suck my left nut because the right nut's busy. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then my favorite fucking thing in the world. My favorite fucking thing in the world. Remember, this is our manager that sends me a, a text message or whatever. It's like, I got you an offer. Fuck yeah. He's like, I got you an offer. I'm going to send over the contract now. It's with a smaller record label that wants to invest in you now and get a multi-album deal as you grow. I was like, holy shit, really? And he's like, it's, it's a great deal. Um, just sign it. You don't even need to read it. Oh, that's not uh, fishy at all. <laughs> uh, so at the time, I was doing a bunch of business shit here. So I had my lawyer, who, as you know, lawyers like 800 an hour. Yeah. I had my lawyer here doing stuff and I was like, yo, can I just like, you know, this is the thing. And this is what my manager said. And my lawyer didn't say this. I'm paraphrasing here, but he's like, pass it to me and I'll read it while I'm like, you know, taking a shit or something. So I don't have to bill you for it or whatever. And he's like, yeah, I'll just look at it. I'll let you know on Monday or whatever. I get a call in like an hour and he's like, fuck this. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I shouldn't have gotten a lawyer to read it. He's like, this is so bad. You don't even um, you don't even negotiate. You just go get fucked because you came at this with such a I hope they're stupid. Um, and that's when I learned the term ambiguous language. Apparently in legal terms, ambiguous language, it's open to interpretation and often defaults to the person that wrote the contract. Oh, so, so how you viewed it reading it doesn't matter. It's how they intended it upon writing, whether or not it's actually conveyed to you. 100%. In short, it was a 360 deal. So that was interesting. And it alluded to the fact that they should get a percentage of Temple Music Academy because I wouldn't be able to discern whether or not the popularity of Without Mercy brought in students. <laughs> wow. And our manager's like, here you go. Don't read it. Durr. That is, jeez. So that holy shit. Management didn't even drop the ball. They just fucking popped and went. I don't know what you're talking about, man. It's it's good. It's fine. <laughs> Fuck, dude. Let alone when COVID finally hit. I leaned into our manager and said, "Do we release this record, or do we wait?" And he's like, "I don't know. What do you want to do?" I was like, "This is why you're here. <laughs> you're like, I'm asking you." What do we do? And he's like, well, you know, there's something to be said about uh, about releasing a record when the big boys aren't. You'd be the only music that's around. See, that sounds enticing, doesn't it? Because you're like, oh, shit, we'd be the only music that's around. It doesn't at all hint to the fact of, like, maybe there's a reason no other bands are releasing fucking records right now. You know, COVID, when no band can tour, but management's still calling you every month going, you had a salary deal, so... Dirty. And we're like, and we're like, what did you do? Well, you know, I'm getting the name out there. Yeah, specifically where? 
Where? Because I'll tell you the other thing they did to us, which is amazing, is they told us, and I'm just going to throw this out there because fuck it, it's our damage has been done. Um, they told us to call loud as hell, hell and bail. They said loud as hell is an awful deal and we need you to pull out because we have a tour with Chimera that we want to put you on instead. And I was like, okay. So I call Jeff and I say, our management is telling us not to take this deal that you're offering. I love you, Jeff. Um, but that's why I'm calling you instead of just sending an email. Yeah. Uh, I'm calling you and saying our management says no, and they want to send us off on tour or whatever with Chimera or whatever. And Jeff's like, you know, well, that sucks. You know, I fucking, you know, we love you guys or whatever. Great human. And, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and then Chimera breaks up. That's right. <laughs> We're like, so there's no Chimera tour. And like, they say nothing until like a weekend after loud as hell, because as you know, in this industry, you're like, okay, well, Chimera broke up, but maybe they're going to slip in like a tray uh, or something. You yeah. Know? Someone like, fill the bill. So, somebody's going to happen or whatever. And you're like, okay, cool. We'll just wait it out or whatever. Nothing. The weekend after loud as hell, they're like, Oh, yeah, so did you go do that loud as hell thing? We're like, no, you fucking told us not to fucking... Oh! <laughs> I was just like, okay. And then we dropped a fucking record, but we dropped it in the month of November, which is the tail end of 2020. So everybody thinks the record's three years old because it's 2023. Um, however, all that aside... The record is uh, our fuck you in the way of the four of us said we were going to write a record that we wanted to write, that we were proud of, that all the things that made us uh, a, four, a quartet or whatever of hilarity, we really approached it like Pantera, where let's just write shit. And we had toured across Canada at this point, and the record was done. But we toured across Canada in 2016. The record was done. And when we got back from tour, we'd stop periodically. And uh, we are like, hey, this song doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? X, Y, Z. And the rule that we made was if anybody has a problem with a song, which is not a song anymore, it has to, it has to go to the whiteboard, which actually I just tore it down here. This is our giant, giant ass whiteboard. Oh, shit. Uh, and it would be like, like, Windigo, Alex, issue with chorus. And then we would go to rehearsal and be like, hey, what's the issue? Alex would present his issue. We try every single idea to exhaust it. I uh, exhaust it to make Alex happy. If it's still a nay, Alex isn't happy, the song is scrapped and we have to revisit it later. That's uh, cool. That's that um, solidarity within the group in writing and making sure that no one individual ever feels left out of the process through that. That's, that's really cool. Cause it allows you guys to do all your songwriting, but it also allows you guys to be able to communicate with each other and not feel like anyone's just playing a song because oh, the guitarist likes it. So it's in the set. I, I, I really, I don't even practice it. I fucking hate this tune. Like, cause there are yeah, a lot well, of bands that do that. The assumption also is like, like, I don't mind saying this to you, but I think, we stopped counting after a certain number just to avoid depression and panic attacks. But to put seismic in your hand was a little north of 40 grand. <sighs> so, um, and that's not including the management thing we're paying the whole time or the, the extra cost to Otero to rush it or um, the world going to shit. So trying to get your CD printed costs double as much because gases and stuff. It's a little north of 40 grand. So if there's four members in the band, you assume that everybody is assuming a $10,000 debt to get that band, uh, the album out. Why would I want to pay 10 grand for something I'm 50% not happy with? No, that's 100% fair. So even the Christmas sweater that you're wearing um, was approved by all four of us before it saw the light of day. That's awesome. That, that way everyone can be proud and stand behind everything that has the Without Mercy logo on it, whether it's music, merchandise, whatever. Everyone can take some pride in it. That's that's really cool. I like that. I yeah. really do. Also, I dig this. This thing is comfy as fuck. 
Um, you brought up, um, and it's kind of just happenstance because I have a few buddies who have also in the past, we'll say the past decade, because the pandemic has fucked with my perception of time. Two years yeah. feels like four and everything like that. So we'll just say within the last 10 years, they're younger. They're a bit younger than I am. They've gone through a situation where they've also, through happenstance, had a large sum of money put into a project, worked with some really solid people in the industry and kind of were treating it as a Hail Mary, I guess. Like, if this doesn't work, we're done. And unfortunately just through happenstance and it's really hard for Canadian musicians even to like with all of that work put in to break through and actually get a huge crowd and a huge like fan base. Um, what would you say to any individual in that who might be feeling defeated after trying that once and failing? Because based off everything you described from your experience with seismic and getting to the release of the album, um, it wasn't stress-free for you at all. In fact, I think it's safe to say all that enthusiasm and excitement towards the process probably, like, didn't dwindle, but there was a lot more uh, stress on there, like you said, with everything else sort of falling short from other people. But what would your advice be to people that maybe feel defeated due to things like that happening to them and not allowing them to move forward? Because I think feel like there are probably a lot of musicians that have that kind of feel even post pandemic where they're just I don't know I tried once twice I know I'm good but maybe just no one cares yeah okay so if if anybody wants the answer to this question which I'm about to get I want you to look at me okay because this is something I truly believe in and I think it is the sole reason live music is dying um there's something in life called the six human needs, and you can Google them and whatever. But human beings are devoted into a percentage based of these six human needs. But there's always one of the human needs that if you Google, you'll see them that is more attuned with your personality, like you require it more. Mm -hmm. If, you, For example, me, I require growth. If I don't feel like I'm growing or improving, I feel like I'm dying and I'm stagnant. And then my pain pleasure matrix, which we can get into at another time or later. I don't care. I got nowhere to be. Um, that gets activated and it just becomes a world of hurt. Your driving force, if that does not meet your or if that doesn't match your blueprint or your life's blueprint. It's been associated with depression a lot. Furthermore, if your driving force of your band does not match the reason you're doing your musical endeavor. You start to say things like, this is the last shot before I just stop this forever. Oh, I'll keep going until I'm 40, but I'll never tour. I don't want to tour. Yeah, I'll spend up to a certain amount of money. And you start to create checkpoints for yourself to bail on it and go backwards. These checkpoints cannot exist, my friends. You have to make sure that the reason is always more important than the result. Why are you doing this? I'll tell you now, the reason I do Without Mercy is because I am never more happier than when I get the chance to perform live. It gives me this creative outlet that I, I'm scared to think of where it would have gone otherwise. And I've gotten the chance to meet rad dudes like you, like Swanee, like uh, Jeff and the Loudest Hell, all these people in my life that never would have happened if I didn't decide that the reason I want to do this was to feel happy and make connections, which all goes into the six human need things. Mm -hmm. I didn't care about the money. Do you really think every member of without mercy magically had the 10 grand necessary? Or do you think some of us were doing a little bit better and just footed the bill? I'm guessing like, there was the a number, lot of give and take. Well, the number of bands, <coughs> excuse me, I have heard break up over something as, like, well, he didn't put in an equal share of merch. What was the equal share of merch? Well, his share was 250 and he put in 225 So we had to kick him out, and now we don't have a drummer. I mean, you probably heard some version of this story. Yeah. And you're like, 25 bucks, eh? So 25 bucks was what it was, was all free. That was your checkpoint. That was your, that was your thing. I'll tell you, man, 
the bill came due for the album and it was like north of 40 grand and i'm sitting there with my amex in hand a bank loan ready and my wife doing overtime going yeah the two of us will fucking pay for it if that's what it's gonna take i just wanted to get that album to the world and the thing is if you're with the right musicians or the right members of your band your relationship your family if you're with the right people that consistency will be there and they will do everything they possibly can to help you along the way. And maybe something as simple as they just make one of the meals that day for you. But that counts, man. Because at the end of the day, it's two o'clock in the morning. You're in butt fuck nowhere swift current. You don't want to be surrounded by the assholes in your band. You want to be surrounded by the best friends in your band that are locked in to do this for the right reason. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt, Fuck everyone that doesn't like what you put out. Because if I asked you, and I, I we've never had this conversation. If I asked you if you legitimately liked Seismic, and you said yes or no, and then I asked probing questions or qualifying statements of what is it that you liked about Seismic, you would give me a few examples. And I guarantee you those few examples are why Metal Blade um century media and all these other labels said no to us because they didn't like that the one thing that i love because you know i'm not a huge tech death guy by any means but i've praised the guitar playing enough just in us talking about the riffs like not only that but the vocal attack and just way alex just he feels so guttural and visceral with how he goes with it every word has intent and you can feel that. And there's something about that that really resonates with me. Because, mm. yeah, just to answer that that question, because I, I've only listened to it a few times, but those are the things that have, like, really been taken away from it. Like, you as a guitar player, like, although there's technical aspects, you also know when to bring it back, slow it down, do the simpler aspect of the guitar to allow the feel of everything going. The drumming is always immaculate, like... That's something I've always loved about you guys since I first saw you live. Has been like shit. This this drummer is too goddamn good, too damn good. Did he just play bleed? Yeah, he just played bleed. He just played bleed. Cool. <laughs> yeah, we did that as a surprise just for you, by the way. Last time we were there. Oh, now knowing that makes me feel like all warm inside. Oh damn! Thank yeah. you. Hey guys, we're we're driving. I forget if we played Lethbridge or not. I don't think we did. I think we just played Calgary and then drove to you. But. uh we we played Calgary and then on the drive out there, I was like, "Hey guys," because you and I were texting or something. Yeah. And they're like, and "They're like, what's up?" And we have like code words in the band, like we say a code word so that we get everybody's attention, and it's not just like somebody feeling like they're overbearing, like potato salad or something. That means, oh shit, there's something wrong with the next gig. <laughs> right? And then everybody's like ready to go. Yeah. Uh, I think Nate's gonna for sure be at that gig there, and they're like, "Oh yeah," I'm like yeah, you guys want to do, you guys want to do bleed. And they're like, yeah, okay, that should that should be fun. Alex is like, yeah, I'm good. Healy, the drummer, he's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I was like, okay. And I shit you not, Ryan and I opened up the tabs and started learning it while driving to the fucking thing. Holy <laughs> shit. And then we start talking like, oh, there's going to be some concerns because the tuning, right? Uh, the tuning's different than what we normally play in, so like the rest of the set will be fucked. Uh, so we'll bullshit the tuning. We'll leave it in the tuning for the tune. Which tune do you guys want to put it in? Oh, let's put it in this one. Okay. And then we all like acapella. No, it sounds like shit after that rhythm. Yeah. Okay. Let's put it here. Try that. No, that's a, that's the song. That's the one we'll put it in. They won't expect it. And we'll just hit the ball running. And then, yeah, we did that just for you, bud. I, I really appreciate that because that show, you went out of your way to do a lot for me. Uh, for those that don't know, back at that point in time, I was running a podcast called The Concrete Wasteland. Um, DJ took time out of his day before the show to come spend like two and a half hours here, which, you know, reflecting on it, that's probably going to be one of my more favorite memories upon moving out of here, like looking back on all the things that have happened in this space. And... Not only did we like just shoot the shit for two and a half hours, and you had some really cool tips for people there. I remember I made like a compilation, but it got to a point where like, oh shit, we should really get going. You're like, well, I mean, like, how much time do we have? Like, what what's Dom say? Like, what what time? What band's on? Oh no, we don't we don't have to like go uber fast. Like we we can we can take our time and like just finish chatting and make our way out. You know, we got we got time, and 
I felt um, you really respected our time, and I hope that you felt the same uh, in that moment because I really appreciated you taking time out of a gig day to be like, ah, I'm gonna go fuck off and talk for two and a half hours about this entire thing instead of you know enjoying a little downtime before the show and then hearing about bl- that little thing. I thought that was just something you guys were doing everywhere for shits and giggles. No, Knowing that you guys I did that on a whim. I don't think we did it anywhere else. I I'm tr- I want to make sure I'm not lying cuz like we were prepping the idea of doing it but never sat down and did it. Uh we were doing we we're doing some uh, Racer X tunes. We were doing those. We threw those around. We just played like Scarified or something, which was uh which was fun. That was fucking hard. <laughs> God damn you, Paul Gilbert. Um but yeah, yeah, it's just no. We knew you were going to be there. We want to do something for you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you um, answering that question because that is something that I'm going to make sure I go back and clip just so that it's sh- like I can share with some people because I definitely feel like there are individuals in not just my scene, but across the board. I think we all in different scenes know different musicians who they get in their own way. And sometimes it's not due to like nefarious reasons. It is just due to things like depression and anxiety and you know that little reminder that you just know why you're doing this don't be distracted with all the other bullshit we need so much external validation and it's it's absurd like like i'll give you an example the name of my band is without mercy i'm going to say that again because (laughs) the name of my band is without mercy you know how many times this comment has been made when we did anything that garnered any kind of attention. The comment came back, some variation of, yeah, but they're not Archspire. And you're like, I know we're not Archspire because our name is Without Mercy. Yeah. We're not Art. Like, like, of course, we have one less member than they do. Not all Canadian like, tech death has to be Archspire. Archspire can be Archspire. Like, like that's that's my point. Like they're Archspire is great. And like the reason they're successful is because they work their fucking asses off at it and they're really good at what they do. They're really good at it. But I would still wager even if they sucked at it, their work ethic has made them amazing. I so yeah, props. Yeah, without mercy. Like literally, what are the reviews we got? It's like yeah, I used to have it framed before we lost our rehearsal space because of COVID. But it, it said like, first of all, you made you made something about um, uh, Alex's vocals. Yeah, yeah, I love Alex's vocals too. It was a sore spot for us because touring and whatnot, Alex didn't have lyrics. He was just making noises, and even uh, up to recording day, Alex hadn't shared his lyrics with us. We interpreted that as the vocalist just being lazy. What we did not suspect is that Alex was honing every single idea so that he would, one, be efficient with the money spent to do vocals, and two, he was super prepared for his emotional release that would happen. Something I never considered was some of the songs like um, uh, like Abysmal. Abysmal has such a close thing to Alex emotionally with what he's saying it's so visceral to alex like he's reliving a trauma that he couldn't do anything after he recorded that that day that's it no i'm done guys like i'm broken now i need to go home and recover we're like holy shit really well then you're thinking as a band like well fuck some of the best songs in the world are emotional trauma being revisited this record's gonna be dope and then you get back the stuff and you're hearing it and you're like Holy fuck, Alex. Holy fuck, dude. Like, some of my favorite shit is when he's, like, he's just losing his mind. And it's it's awesome. But again, exterior uh, validation required in the sense of people are like, yeah, but he should really pick a lane, meaning he should pick a genre or something. Like, okay, we need to be fixated to a genre. He's like, yeah, they're great, I guess. But Archspire plays this fast, and here's this video of Archspire. And it got to the point where, like, we would post a video, and there'd be links to Archspire songs underneath the fucking video. And I'm like, I mean, you're kind of helping the algorithm, because Archspire's way bigger than we are. Oh, yeah. Thanks for 
Thanks for sharing us in the conversation. Jesus. But like, if you haven't matched that um, life blueprint driving force thing, those comments make you not want to play music anymore because you start to go, I'll never be as good as Archspire. Well, that's not what they're saying. They're saying you're not Archspire. But isn't that also exactly what you were going for? Yeah, you're trying to be your own thing, not someone else. And uh, just to comment on Alex's vocals again, because we watched uh, the Disinfect the Soul video uh, before oh, yeah. he came on. And man, I can only imagine the vibes in the booth while doing that one, because that sounds like the way it's set up lyrically, how he has revisiting package, um, passages um, at different points to kind of convey where it's at at that point and it's really powerful i can only imagine like what the vibe is like in that room because there's something about vocal tracking especially that it can have its own feeling like guitar tracking always feels cool because you got like gnarly fucking guitar tones and you're like fuck yeah we're nailing this same with drums with bass but there's that emotional connection on the vocal recording aspect that can be extremely visceral. And that's one thing I could definitely kind of get upon listening to it too, is just like nothing's phoned in. Like you said, he spent his time honing his craft and refining and figuring out exactly what the intent was going to be behind everything. And I, I yeah. have a lot of respect for that because it really does yeah, my opinion come through. A lot of band fights doing vocal tracking, right? Because like he would he would have this idea, and me as a theory guy, I'd be like, yeah, but Alex, the beats don't line up. Like there's too many syllables that you're a beat over, and now our hard one is hitting, and he's he's like, well, that's that makes it different. And I'm like, Alex, I don't know, like buddy, I, I'm trying not to. And then you know, he's already emotionally exposed and stuff, so it created a thing. But probably the biggest fights are with Matt doing drums. Really? This is, uh, uh, yeah, that's yeah, huge. Because I sit behind the wall. You can't hear me unless I push a button. We listen to his take. And then I push a button. And I was like, uh, so are we ready to do it for real? And then I would just like take the button off. He would just like blah, blah, blah. And at one point, at one point, I remember saying this. Because I, I love this story. I love this story. Because... At one point, we're tracking Abysmal, which starts with that fucking drum intro, right? Yeah. Which, when we were writing the song, I we wrote it as, bah, and Matt would just be like, one, two, three, four. And I was like, you're not allowed to do anything except count us. That's all I want you to do, Matt. And he's like, what? And then he would like hit a snare or something when we were writing the song. And I would just stop playing guitar. I'd shut my amp off. I'd go for a walk. <laughs> like, I was setting the tone a year ago for this. And uh, I was, I remember being like, what the fuck did I tell you you're doing? Like, I told you what to do. And he was all like, okay, what the fuck, man? And um, I think in the back of his mind, he was like, DJ's going for something because he wouldn't speak to me like this unless there was a thing he was going for. So we're recording the thing, yada, yada, yada. Matt's had like a 12-hour day in the studio. Death. It's horrific. He's dead tired. We're doing abysmal. He's done a bunch of takes for this. And, uh, and I, for the the opening, which guys, please listen to it. I'm very proud of what Matt played on that track. Um, and, and I press the button. He's dead tired. Like, I think the microphone is picking up the sweat dripping onto the camera, right? <laughs> Like, like he's he's fucking ruined, and he's just like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I just push the button, and I'm like, okay, are you ready to do it for real now or what? And then I let go, and he just beaks off. He's like, you ever ride my ass all fucking day? Why don't you come in here and do that? And I and I click the button. I go, if that was an option, we all would have gone home six hours ago. <gasps> and I click the button. <laughs> Uh, uh, oh my god and you just see him go like this and he just like he like leans into I don't remember if it was the hi-hat or the stare but one of the mics he just leans into it and he goes hit the fucking button and like you know the pre-roll and the click track it starts and he he's like taking his shirt off he's that fucking mad and then he just like lays this fuck and that's the take that's on the record <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> See, these are the things I love about recording because they're you don't sometimes it has to get to that point for the take to come out. Like it and it creates a funny story to go with it too, and a nice memory every time you probably hear that now. You're probably thinking of that moment right before when you hit the button, you were like, All right. The best thing was we had our we had our band Christmas dinner. We do one every year. I cook the turkey and stuff for the guys and we get together because I thought it was always important. And honestly, any bands, please, please heed this advice. Not that I'm in the position to give you advice, but please, uh, it's at least once a year. You got to get together for no business reason. Just hang. That's I please do that. So we do it at our Christmas dinner. We don't talk business. We just hang. Matt gets a little emotional because a couple of wobbly pops, you know, and he's like, he just said, he looks at me like this and he's like, thank you. And I knew what he meant. I knew he meant that recording. I knew he meant that track. And I was just <laughs> like, I got you, buddy. Cause like, that's the push you needed. You would have listened to the entire record and been like, I could have done better. The opening of abysmal. eh?" And I would have been like, yeah, you know, probably. Like, I remember, like, horrible things. Like, do you want me to go outside and get a drunk homeless guy to show you how to do this? Or, like, <laughs> at least for him, he'll record this for a sandwich. Like, you know, oh! like, there's all... It was awesome. It was awesome. Oh, it's a good thing we're not in a pro studio or nothing. Everybody's watching you just shit the bed. <laughs> <laughs> just, just go and write... For it, I, I love just lighting that fire, lighting that oh, fucking buddy, fire. At, at one point, I think he just left the studio, and I was his ride in Vancouver, and he lives like an hour and a half away from Vancouver. So I don't even know how the fuck he got home that day. I go home, and I'm saying to Janelle, like, "Oh my god, I might have crossed the line," and she's like, "But was it for a good reason?" I'm like, "Yes, because what I got out of him was insanity that people are going to talk about it for years after the record. They're not going to believe it's Matt playing that. They're going to think we programmed it or or let him punch in an extra foot or something. It's fucking Matt playing everything. Which which is great. And that's yeah, that's another thing they didn't like on the on the comment thread. They didn't like that. They didn't like that a lot of it is um uh, fluctuates in tempo, and I went, yeah, because we went at this like Pantera. Pantera didn't use metronomes and shit. Yeah, if you, you play together, it works. Suggestions, but uh, yeah, everyone was like, oh, I don't know what this blues jam is randomly and abysmal. Yeah, because we wanted to put in a fucking blues jam. It's like <laughs> it's the 2020s, guys. There's this thing, there's this thing called genre meshing that has been a thing for like 20 years now, maybe maybe 30. And, you know, well, yeah, actually, may I share the story of where the Blues Jam came from? Yes, please do. OK, we we're playing live. I, I forget where it was. It's always somewhere in Alberta. And my amp or something died. Something like I, I went dead. And kudos to the guy, the guys, because they were we we're all playing the songs like or whatever. My amp dies. Matt recognizes it, hits the China once. Rye Guy, our bass player, goes, China's not in this song. Looks over at Matt. Matt goes, Ryan looks at me and goes, Amstead. Okay. And at the end of the phrase, they just went, boom, into like a blues jam. While Alex ran over and helped me fix my rig. And then I turned around and was like, I'm good. And this is, th you're Matt. You're the drummer. And yeah. I'm, I fixed my rig. This is me telling you, okay, I'm good. Let's keep going. Was this. And then we just fucking played, and we just kept going. I joined them in key. We jammed. I looked at Matt like this, which is like, I'm making eye contact means I'm good, bro. And then we just played. We kept going with the song. That's <laughs> that, that, I think, shows the level of chemistry you guys have. Like you said, you guys have, like, little words to communicate and little things on stage, too, like that, that just let everyone know kind of what's up without, like, saying it out loud and distracting from the show in like that instance that's one of the slickest recoveries I've heard of due to like an amp failure on stage like damn bravo to everyone involved on that Lizzie has a yeah, question we, quickly before, oh, before yeah. I, Lizzie hit me hit she's me. wondering about Matt does he play abysmal that way live now too though so basically now is it ingrained in him and it's like alright no it's just gonna 
that's just how it is now. I, my short answer is yes, but I think what's ingrained in Matt is I don't want to fuck this up because DJ is going to say something. <laughs> I think I think that he's like that's I don't want that I don't want that at all ever again because he said that homeless comment and I didn't like it. We got like a minimum of three hours in the vehicle on the way home. I, I no, nope nope we're hitting it tonight. I yeah. do not want to hear about I, that. I'm the kind of guy. I'm the kind of guy that like um uh this this is gonna make me sound like a dick out of context, but. We used to have members in our band that couldn't control consumption of alcohol before playing, which would cause them to fuck up. And then the whole ride from Medicine Hat, Alberta, back to Abbotsford. I have a recording of the show going, hey, guys, remember when this happened? Click. Oh, that's not the right key, is it? <laughs> no. I, I think that might be in the key of one too many kokanees. But I'm not exactly sure. You know what? I'll ask someone. And then I would phone someone. Hey, can you listen to this real quick? Yeah, it doesn't sound like that's right, does it? No, no, I don't think so. Now, I don't know what the problem was. Let's let's go through the van. I know I played it right. Ryan, did you play it right? Yeah, I think you did okay. So was it Alex or Matt? Which one do you think it was? Now, to anybody in the chat, that seems like I'm being passive aggressive. But, like, the thing about the band is I'm kind of de facto leader. Not in the sense of, like, that's a real role per se. But, like, just because they're like, yeah, DJ gets it done and it's cool. We can just play music. I go to Nate, the promoter. And he's like, yeah, I want to book without mercy. And I'm like, good, man. I need at least 500 or we can't show up. And he's like, okay, and then we make this deal, five, 600, whatever, and it's all good, life's great, blah, blah, blah. So you guys made me go get 600 bucks from Nate, and then you got drunk and shit the bed on the whole set. So how am I going to go back to Nate in six months and get our 600 again? You just dropped us down to 250. Yep. I, that so. is, that's really great advice, because I feel... Especially young musicians. I feel there may be some older ones that still haven't figured it out, but I'd like to think more people are becoming wiser to the idea of knowing your limits and knowing that your first impression as a band going into a new area really heavily dictates what happens the next time, if there is a yeah. next time. Yeah. Well, even we had a little thing that was an issue last time we came through. And what solved it was you and I think Swanee at the time going, no, 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 we've worked with DJ and the band before. This is, I don't know why you're worried. This never happens, whatever the problem was or whatever. And actually, I think you guys even solved it. I didn't even have to like hear about it. I can't remember what the problem was, but I do remember being approached by the person who was booking it or by Swan by proxy and being like, we're dealing with this. And I just talked it out with them and was like, it's fucking without mercy. Like this is one of those guys where if we bring them, people will come. They do not disappoint. They come from a far, fair distance, and then they make people like they, they make that time worth it. Because there's a lot of bands that would maybe phone it in, drive down, and like you said, have someone be drunk, or have the entire band drunk, and not do their shit. We've had a few hip hop headliners pull that off in the past. But and usually the reason for that is because you've mixed up this and this. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you, you, I'm in a band because it, you know, it's my chance to get away from the family for a night, get drunk, have fun with my friends. Okay. But you're in the wrong promotion league then if you're trying to negotiate funds and t shirt sales and shit like that. I think the greatest compliment, honestly, was from Nuclear Oath. I think they gave us a compliment once. And because we had showed up, I think it was this show, we had showed up. We are haggard as fuck because we're so tired. Because, like, as you know, like, you play Calgary at, like, and you get off stage at 2 a.m., and then we start driving to see you. You guys are three and a half, four hours away. Um, we roll into town at the right time to make sure we get, like, the check-in time and stuff like that. No hotels. We're thrashed. I'm, and we get out, and we just look like we're fucking ruined. 
Um, I still come do the podcast thing with you, give you everything I got, like full energy, yeah. yada, yada. We get there. The guys are still kind of haggard. And Nuka is like, oh, my God, like these guys look really haggard. Then we got on stage and it was like we've slept for eight years. We're good to go. We fucking lose everything. We're like it was just I remember that it was so much fun that that show because you guys were so into it. And then we played bleed and you guys lost your fucking minds. <laughs> I um, remember the look you gave me right before that, too, because you, you made sure to be like, hey. Hey. Deliver, deliver, yeah. deliver, deliver. Yeah. I was just like, oh, <laughs> fuck you. Yeah, I was hilarious. We could barely hear Alex because you were screaming so loud. <laughs> it, was, it was great. And then we get off stage and Nuclear Oath is like, you guys were so tired beforehand. And we're like, yeah. But you're not tired now. No, I'm still fucking tired. But these people, you know, paid 15 bucks to get in. I know it sounds super cliche and cheesy, but these people had to work so much time to get enough money to afford their bills and their lifestyles, etc., and still wanted to spend disposable income to... I'm not arrogant enough to assume they paid the money just to come see us. It was like the show they wanted to go see. But you're part of the entertainment, therefore you feel some sort of responsibility to make sure that that hard work is respected and acknowledged and reciprocated and given back to them through what you can give them as a live band. 100%. I think that's the duty that we need to have, for sure. I love that. I think th there's so many things that I feel, um, even if we just cherry-picked this conversation, there's so many like little nuggets of just like good ethic in regards to the mentality of how to go about this. Because you even brought up the whole like, this versus that in regards to like maybe you're in the wrong kind of band maybe you are the guy that just wants to chill on the weekends play live shows but you're in a band with three other guys that are like dude no we want to we want to do something with this and it's not that we don't love you just like we need you to like either work with us or we need to figure out what to do and recognizing what you want out of music will make it a lot easier to make the decisions in how you engage with music as well, whether you pursue bands, you pursue, pursue promotion, um, education, um, live audio. Like there's so many people we know that do so many different things. You, uh, we name dropped Jeff earlier with loud as hell. Mm -hmm. Like, um, that's someone who's putting a lot of hard work and ethic and building loud as hell. And they're on what year 11 now this year thinking about it but no I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm stretching I'm stretching a point without uh, meaning to but just having putting the right foot forward and I really appreciate um, all these little things that we've kind of touched on today um, with everything I'm not trying to like wind wind us down I'm just realizing how much value there is in this conversation I think and I want to I want to thank you for that so far because this has been really cool because um there's a lot. There's a lot there. <laughs> yes, the streak continues. <laughs> <laughs> As always. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that you would maybe uh, want to touch on, talk about, any advice you'd want to give out? Um, I know it's not as late for you as it is for me, and I am more than glad to have you on as long as you are available or as long as you want to talk. But I'm curious, is there anything that you uh, particularly want to touch on that we maybe haven't? I don't think so, man. Just make sure you have the right people in your corner and you're doing things for the right reasons. Work harder than everybody else. That's that's the secret weapon here, man. That's really the secret weapon. There's no shortcuts. I think that's, a, that's another one, I think. I know I personally had to get over that a long time ago. Like recognizing there's no easy way at this yeah and there's no i think set way either i think everyone has a different journey and it's about um taking those experiences learning from them but also things like this taking from conversations with people like you or the people we interact with and learning from those as we can so that we know how to move forward and just do what we can and most importantly like you said surrounding ourselves with the right people um I think that's something that's been very consistent within everything you've brought up. 
Um, with that, quickly, huge shout out to uh, With Conviction for subscribing. Uh, much love, DJ. I'm, I'm curious. Ooh. You're probably going to get one of these too, but everyone gets one of these. Yeah. I, lo I love my little soundboard. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sick, dude. Yeah, man. Um, if I'm ever, if I'm lucky enough to get anybody on my Instagram, look at one of the most recent posts that I posted. It's uh, this picture of a sign that says, nobody cares, work harder. I think it's too easy to make an excuse for, for something and why you can't do something. So I always try and tell people, I challenge you to give me just one reason why you can do it instead of 80 reasons why you can't. I have heard you say that, and not just in passing. Uh, for anyone uh, here in the chat, these are actually words that uh, DJ actually gave me back when I was first like talking to him off and on, and in this funk of like, I, uh, I'm not saying I'm going to give up, but I'm questioning every aspect of what I do and what I'm pursuing because I just don't feel like maybe I'm capable, mm -hmm. and that was. That was the one thing that you brought up after listening to me bitch about my perspective at the time. Pretty sure that was the one thing that you said. It's like, that's great. Now give me one reason why you can or should. And it's amazing what that can do for shifting perspectives. Um, once again, DJ, I want to thank you for your time. I have a feeling like we're going to need to have more conversations, not just on stream, but... Uh, like I said, four years is too fucking long. And that is mainly on me for just being bad at maintaining communication. I have a horrible habit of losing track of people as they fi fall just further down my message box. That ADHD brain and the whole uh, object permanence is a big issue for me sometimes. <laughs> and I am bad it at might that. Also, it might also not help that I don't use Facebook anymore. Hey, I now got you on Discord now, so I'll be able to find that, you. That is true. That um, is true. Any final words? I know um, places to find you, Temple Music, any last nuggets to leave people with. We are going to check out Abysmal the moment this ends because I feel like we've talked up that that intro so much that we got to put it on. But, um, <laughs> yes, where can people find you? Everything, not just Without Mercy, but Temple, the whole gang shebang. Uh, please come find me on Instagram. I have two accounts, both uh, my personal one, which is Ginger Tornado. You can also find me under the Temple Music Academy or Temple Music Academy. I'm on Twitch. Uh, you can catch us live streaming actually to Twitch and YouTube every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific time. We'll break down music via Super Chat request. I'll tell you guys theory stuff, and I'll basically just talk because I love the sound of my own voice. Narcissism's real. Come find <laughs> me on Instagram. Join our Discord, the whole nine, Temple Music Academy or Ginger Tornado. And my friend Nate, I would love to share with you. I recently turned forty. No, and I have never. I have never drank in my life. But on my fortieth birthday, I had my first drink ever. Wow! And I I did this toast. Now, although this is water, I wish to toast you and your entire audience. The toast I used, which is, "May the most that you wish for, be the least that you get." Cheers. Cheers to you, my friend. And I can't believe you're 40. Yeah. My goodness. You don't you don't look a day over 36. Oh shit. Oh shit. <laughs> I'm only 40 from the waist up. <laughs> That's where all the sags happening. Yeah, 100%. Down low. 100%. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you again, DJ. I'm going to let you go. I again appreciate you taking the time to be here. I appreciate you for just doing what you do within your community with Temple Music. Keep doing what you do with Without Mercy. Best foot forward. And uh, I hope you have better luck with management and individuals that are supposed to help you in those positions in the future. As do I. <laughs> <laughs> Much love, my friend. You take care. And we're going to send you off with a nice little... Much love. Enjoy the rest of your night. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks, buddy. Take care. <laughs> that was DJ the Ginger Tornado of Without Mercy Temple Music Academy. 
Much love to him. Uh...